going to continue. Uh, I, I hope this will be the, the last one on this thought. Um, this week the Lord kind of laid something else uh, on my heart. I want to go a different direction. But there's some things that, that I want to say and, and to finish up um, this message. And the title of the message is When We Almost Believe. And like I said before, that's kind of a, a play on words. But, um, you know, Jesus said, no man can come unto me unless he is first drawn by the Father. You know, God has to draw us. And, uh, you know, we uh, there's so many opposing things. Uh, spirits, you know, attitudes, carnality, so many opposing forces in the world. Uh, you know, Satan, we have to realize Satan is a created being. We can't ever underestimate the power of the enemy. I mean, he does have, the Bible says he is the prince of this world. But he is a created being, and there's only certain things that he can place a thought into our mind, or he may place an obstacle in our way. But he has no ability to create in our life. He, and he, he has no ability to force us to go beyond the word. When we go beyond the word, it's because we have chosen to do that. And so um, we need to understand that. We need to understand who we are, what God has given us, the strength that he has provided for us, um, because we certainly need it in this age that we're living in, don't we? Amen. So before I go, um, I want to say a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of being here today. We thank you, Lord, that you're real, that your word has power and strength. And Lord, we read about in the scripture that everywhere that uh, the word was preached, that your power was on display. And Lord, that is our desire. Lord, it may not be on display to the world, but God, I believe that you're working and moving in the lives of your people, in the lives of the bride, and we just ask you, Lord, to lead us and guide us and direct us, Lord, and help us to just grasp hold of the power, Lord, that we need. We just praise you, we thank you, Lord. We know that you've provided all things. In Jesus' name, amen. I hate that some can't be here today. But it's just good to be in his presence. It's good to feel the anointing of the Lord. And I appreciate that so much. But if you want to turn, I want to, I want to go back. I said I would read those four things. But I want to go to 2 Thessalonians. And I want to read that again. Um, I've done a lot of research over the last few years, over the last few weeks about some of the things that I've been preaching. And I was doing some research the other day. Um, about uh, the Antichrist and about book Revelation and, and uh, what we know is going to take place uh, just right up the road. Uh, you know, nothing takes God by surprise. Amen. He's worked it out. He's planned it all out. But as I've been studying here in 2 Thessalonians, I was looking at some uh, things and I've been listening to a lot of different things and I've been reading some things. And, um, in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 17, it talks about uh, the harlot and the beast. We've read that, we've heard that preached, you know, pretty much our whole Christian life. And I don't want to go into that a whole lot. But, you know, in the, in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, it's, it talks about Mystery Babylon, the great... The mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And, you know, it talks about the Antichrist and it talks about the beast. And I was doing some research on, on that and and I, something I didn't know, I, I may have heard it years ago, but it may have slipped my memory. But, uh, you know, Europe, where we know that the Pope and the Catholicism is entrenched, and that's where it started, was in Rome. And we know and understand that uh, when the Roman Catholic Church was born around 325 A.D., it was a mixture of when uh, Constantine, you know, influenced and, and had the, the Catholic Church begin to birth around 325 A.D., it was Catholicism's always been a mixture of mysticism, mythology, and Christianity. And so... Uh, 
it's been entrenched very strongly in, in the nation of, of Europe. And I was listening to some preaching uh, from Brother Allen, and he was talking about how that deadly wound was placed upon the church. We, we've read this and heard about it almost our whole Christian life. But the Catholic Church has come back, and something that I didn't know, uh, the nation of Europe, the, even the name was, is based upon a, a mythology story. There was a, a Phoenician princess named Europa, and Zeus was one of the mythology gods, came down and was attracted to Europa. And so even in today society, we know that the nation, the word Europe, comes from that story in mythology where Europa um, was taken by Zeus. And so the symbol, which, what really thrown me was when I started doing some research on it, I wanted to, to print a picture out, but I couldn't get my printer to work on that picture. But uh, I'm still using that same ink, by the way. <laughs> I, never, I went and bought some more, but I haven't changed it. But uh, I wanted to, to print out a picture. But in 2012, the, nation, the nations of Europe began to, to print the Euro. And they used a picture that's been around for thousands of years since this story of mythology was, was invented, I guess, of a woman riding a bull or a beast. And so even the symbol of the Euro games in Europe today, their symbol is a woman riding a beast or a bull. And so I believe that we're, we know that what that represents, the Pope and that European system, or the Catholicism and the European system, and we know that that is so entrenched that that is where that Antichrist comes in that will make that covenant with the nation of Israel, and I mentioned this covenant that is being formed right now. So, so there's so many things, and I get cold chills just talking about it. There's so many things going on with Europe and with even the symbolism and with the Catholic Church and with the covenant of, of Israel and all the things that's going on in the Middle East. We're, we're right at the door. And this thing is about to wind up. And I know that we've, you know, we've heard even back in, in 2,000 years ago, Lonnie was talking about, you know, Peter said, because people said, where is the, where is the Lord's return? When, when is this going to happen? When is the Messiah going to come? And Peter said that God is not slack concerning his promises as people count slackness, but he is faithful and patient to us. We're not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what Brother Lonnie was talking about. You know, it, it, a lot of it is, you know, rebellion. We understand that when the, when the children of Israel was in Egypt, God said you'll be down there for 400 years. But I believe it was an extra, th they were actually there for, for 30 years. They were mistreated for 400. But I believe that that 30-year period was added because of their rebellion. And so God has a way of doing things. He knows what it's going to be. He knows what we're going to do. But there's so many pictures, so many prophetic pictures coming into place even with what I read in Isaiah chapter 14 there's so many things coming into place and that it just it, it astounds me that every day it's like this picture starts to come together and it becomes clearer and clearer I see it clearer now than I ever have there was a lot of things maybe 5 or 10 or 15, 20, 30 years ago that we didn't see real clear we heard it preached and we believed it and we understood it in part maybe. But when you start seeing these prophetic things take place, when you start seeing the world events going on, and then you take it and lay it right up on the scripture, you get that aha moment. And it becomes clear to you. And so I read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'm just going to read a few verses here. But I was talking about that lie. And, I, and I, I mentioned secular humanism. I don't know, you may have never heard that term, but you know what it's all about. You've seen that spirit. That's just a fancy word for what we see going on in, in the minds and hearts of, of the world. Not just, not just the United States, but it's the whole world. This, this, this idea 
of me first has been around since when I was talking about in, in Isaiah 14 when Satan said, I will do this and I will be exalted. I will put myself in a, next to God. I will exalt myself above my peers. There's a spirit. Everything is, everything is done and motivated by a spirit. And, and I have to say, a lot of times what upsets me and is disheartening to me when I look around and people that are they're calling themselves the bride or they say they've got a message for the end time and they're more interested in self and they're more interested in it being exalted themselves than they are the what, what's going on in the body and benefiting the body of Christ. They're more, they're more interested in being exalted themselves. It opens my eyes up completely to the spirit that motivates people. And it, it lets me know that those are the kind of things that, that we need to stay away from. I believe that the, the Word of God is clear. We may not have seen... I see spirits in different people, in different individuals, organizations, nations. I see, I see spirits being manifested in a way today that we didn't see 30 or 40 years ago. You know, if we think back when we were maybe... Uh, years ago, we thought every, everything was fine. We thought, well, you know, we're going to be raptured before our children grow up. They're not going to have a chance to go to college. They're not going to. We're not going to be grandparents or great grandparents. If you thought like I know, I've said this before. We all thought that. But here we are, and all these things have happened. But what I've seen besides that is that I've seen spirits being manifested in people. And in places that I never thought would happen. But it's, it's happening. I've seen it happen. And when people desire to be lifted up, there's a problem with that. I've got a problem with that. I think the Word of God has a problem with that as well. And so here in 2 Thessalonians it says, Even him, verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, Whose coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and signs and lying wonders. Now remember what I was talking about just a few minutes ago about that beast, that woman riding that beast. We know what that is. I don't want to get into a lot of that. But we know that that's that Roman Catholicism spirit riding that system. And it says, With all the deceivableness, deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this God... And for this cause, God shall send them. Now see, uh, Paul goes right back to verse 3. He says, in verse 3 it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Well, Paul describes this man of sin. He describes this spirit. But then here in verse 11, he goes right back to verse 3 and he says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie in the King James Version, but when you look over into the, the your if you've got a, a concordance in your Bible, if you look over, it'll say thee. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's talking about a, a particular certain lie. And when I first read that, and it struck me about the lie, I thought, well, what is that lie? This has been a month or so ago when I started really studying on it. And I've seen this connection through the scripture. And I mentioned last week, even in the Garden of Eden, and when, when, when the serpent came to Eve and he said, you shall not surely die. That lie changes the truth of God. It exalts, it exalts what a person thinks. It exalts a man's or a woman's ideas or a nation's ideas above what God says to do, above the things that, that God wants to do. So it is exalting self. And we've seen that when I connected uh, Isaiah 14, when Satan said, I will be like God, I will do this and I will do that, he was exalting his own thoughts. He was exalting his own, his own motive and his own purpose above the things of God. And that same spirit that is a thread that runs all the way through the Scripture. And we see it even in our society today. What's going on in the United States today? People have exalted themselves above what is right and proper in the things of God, by the word of God. And it says, And for this cause they sh God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. 
Secular humanism. Like I said, that's a fancy word. That's just a modern name. But once I, once I go on through here just a little bit, you'll understand exactly. My goal. We know. We see what's going on. We've been serving the Lord long enough. And even if you've not been in church very long. Even if you don't know the scripture very well. Even if you're not real familiar with the things of God, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see what's taking place around us today. See what's going on in the world around us today. And I said I would read these four things again. The first one is the belief that people are capable of being moral or ethical without religion or the belief in a deity. Now we know what religion is. We're talking about salvation, aren't we? The belief that a person is capable of being moral and ethical without, without faith, without religion, without salvation, or the belief in a deity. People think that they can, they can do the right thing, that they can make the right choices without believing they may, that may last for a season, but ultimately what always happens is they lift themselves or they... They exalt themselves above everything else and above the things of God. Number two, that humans are inherently neither good nor evil and are not superior to nature. Now we know that. That men within us, the Bible says there is no good thing. It says, the Bible says, also the scripture also says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there is not... It, we're, we're, we're not inherently either good or evil. We are inherently evil. Yeah. And without the Spirit of God, without the correction of the Spirit, we cannot do good. We can may do a good deed, but there's another motive that motivates us to do that thing that we do. So the only thing that, that, that can bring goodness in our life is the Spirit of God. Yeah. Number three, that each individual, individual has the right to to base their own life and their own decisions and change accordingly without faith. Basically what's going on in our society today, people say, I don't need a God. I can make my own decisions. If I mess up here, then I just adjust I just adjust the things that I'm doing so the outcome that I desire or the thing that the outcome that I want changes. But see, here's the problem with that. Brothers and sisters, there's no way that we can reach this outcome without there being intervention. What people are doing, they're taking away the foundation. We have to have a foundation. We have to have something that says, here is the way that you live. Here is the way that you do things. Here is the way that you conduct yourself. Without some sort of guidance and without some sort of foundation to lay ourselves on, then everybody else's idea is just as good as everybody else's. And that is the, that's the thought in our society today, that as long as I don't hurt you and I don't do harm to you or I don't do harm to society, I can make my own choices and I can make my own decisions. As long as I don't do harm to anybody, everything that I do is based upon what I think is best. Not what God says is best. What people, what, what society is actually doing is they're taking God out of everything. Number four, to continue to adapt their moral their morals based on the search for truth and philosophy. In other words, people finding their own truth. People looking for their own way of doing things. That's what we see going on today. If you've ever, ever watched any TV, so many people get up and they say, well, you know, I believe there's other ways that heaven... See, people want to go to heaven. And, and how can you believe that there is even a heaven without believing that there's a God? You know, I don't know, that some atheists, I guess, suppose they, they, you just die and you're just like a dog. And, and the, the, high, the whole, one of the ideas behind secular humanism is we're no different than the animals. When we die, we're just, we're just over. We, you just bury us and put our bones in the ground and that's the end of the story. But that's not the end of the story. Amen. That's not the end of the story. The Bible says in the beginning, God created us in his image. What does that mean? 
that we have, were a living soul, God put in us something different that made us different than the cattle and the deer and the dogs mm-hmm. and the cat. He put something within us that was connected to Him. He put mm-hmm. something within man, whether we're saved or not saved, whether we've mm-hmm. ever, ever been born again, God put something within humanity to make us different, to give us the ability to connect with Him. And what people have done, it says they believe they lie, they have suppressed the truth of God, and it says for this cause God God turned them over to a strong delusion. God won't force you to do anything. If that's what you want to believe, you say it long enough and you preach it long enough and you believe it long enough, pretty soon God's going to say, well, that's the way, if that's the way you want it, then you can go that way. Yeah. So that's the idea. We call that, this name was given sometime in, in, the, in the 20th century. But in 1980, now this was the thing that really... I, I, I know a little bit of Hebrew because I've, I've studied and I've listened. And this is no feather in my cap, but I've, I've listened to so much and I've studied so much down through the years that when I hear a word that it, it, sometimes it'll ring a bell in my mind. And this was what happened when I read this. In 1980, secular humanists formed a council and the name of their council was called Council for Democratic and Secular Humanism. In other words, they have a group. They're a group. They're an established group. I don't know whether they're tax exempt. They probably are. And they use the acronym. If you know what an acronym is, you take the first letter of every word and it forms a word. And their acronym for their society is called Kodesh. And I was listening to that. I promise you, I was listening to that. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Their their acronym for their society, Council for Democratic and Secular Humanism. When I heard Kodesh, it's a Hebrew word. And it's a Hebrew word that is tied to the priesthood. It's, It's a Hebrew word that is tied to the anointing, to the power of God. But even further than that, The word Kodesh means to be set apart, just like the priest was set apart. Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and 9, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and placed you in his marvelous light. So that word Kodesh in the Hebrew means to set apart, but there... There's another word that it means even more. When I started, when you start dealing with these Hebrew and, and, and Greek and Latin words, it'll go down, you'll see all these meanings, all these meanings, and it takes you to a meaning where it may not be as out there in the front. But I want to read this and I'll tell you what, what it means. Hebrew four, uh, Isaiah 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I read this last week, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground and didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud I will be like the Most High God. Kodesh in the Hebrew means exalted. And when I heard that, it just, it floored me. I don't even know that they knew. They probably didn't. Me and Coach was talking about that. So many things happen sometimes. People aren't even aware of what they're doing. People aren't even aware of what they're saying. People aren't even aware of the spirit that motivates them. And so when I read this and it said Council for Democratic Secular Humanism and the acronym was Kodesh, it brought back to my mind the Hebrew word Kodesh, which means in line with the priesthood, but it means to be exalted. And I went back to Isaiah 14 and those five I will statements that Satan said. What was he saying? I will be exalted. And when I read that, I thought that is the spirit that, that is in this age, that's the spirit that's controlling 
this nation, that's the spirit that we see controlling people, that's the spirit. I will, and when, when a person says, I'm going to do things my way, I'm going to do the things that I want to do, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, it doesn't matter what the Bible says, I don't care what the preacher says. I have actually heard people say, well, yeah, I know that's in the Bible, but I don't really believe it that way, or I don't see it that way. What is a person doing when they do that? They are exalting their own ideas above the Word of God. And brothers and sisters, when we exalt exalt our ideas above the word of God. We are placing ourselves right there in Isaiah 14 with Satan and satanic forces. When we lift ourselves above the things of God and we say my thoughts and my ideas and my desires are more important than the word of God. We are exalting ourselves above the things of God. And then I see that, I see that spirit alive today in society. People take the word of God and they twist it and they form it and they make it into things whatever they want whatever they desire to be they twist the word of God and make it say things that it's not saying there's a spirit behind that sometimes people do that intentionally sometimes people may not do that intentionally but we need to make sure the things that we think the things that we do how we behave how we perceive the world around us what's going on in our life the things that we allow in our life that we don't exalt our ideas and our own ways of thinking above the things of God because there is a spirit that is behind that and it is the same spirit that dealt with Satan when he said I will do this and I will do that. It's that same spirit. See, the problem is this lie. We've seen the lie. We've been trying to identify. My job, this little church here, I feel my responsibility is not to preach what I want, not to make the scripture say something that I want, but to prepare us and to help each one of us, including myself, to help each one of us understand the spirits that we're dealing with, to know what's going on when something pokes its head up, when we see Satan working and we see Satan doing certain things, to have, have the ability by the Word of God to know where we stand and to know how to deal with these things that's going on in our Amen. life. Amen. There's spirits behind what we see going on. Now, we, I can't tell you, I mean, other than watching the news and knowing what's going on and, and, and it's been going on in other nations for, for decades, I can't really speak firsthand but, except for what I see going on in this nation, for what I see going on in our schools, in our governments, in our homes, for what, what I see being displayed in, in churches. And we think just because we, we say we're the bride of Christ or we say that we're this or we're the First Baptist Church down on the corner of the Church of God or whatever organization we think that we're above that. I'm here to tell you we're not above that because Satan can creep in this same idea, this same way of thinking. And we've seen it happen all down even back in the Old Testament when we see the children of Israel, when they would get out of the will of God and they would start looking and lusting after these other nations and the things that they were doing, we see that same spirit would begin to creep in. And before you know it, they would find themselves falling before God. They would find themselves guilty of the things God was trying to rid them of. And that's the same thing that's going on today. We think that we may be exempt from what's going on in our nation. The way people think, you know, you go, you go on a job site, you go to, to the mall, you go to places around, you go to schools, and there's a train of thought that's taking place. Did you know that? There's an atmosphere. There's a, and why is that? Because there's a spirit. There's, a, there's there, that Kodesh spirit, that exalted, people want to be exalted. And we think just because we go to a church and we go to church once or twice a week that we're exempt from that. But just what has already been said, if we don't come to church to yield our members to Christ and to die to self, if we come to church just to say I've come to church and I've went through the motions, then guess what? That spirit is, is trying to find its way in our life. See, 
The problem is that lies manage, manifest in itself, right? But it's right among the church, but it's very subtle. And it's happened over, it's happened over a period of time. You know, I look at other churches and I see what, what's going on in, 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 in other places. But you know, sometimes we really need to, we really need to look at ourselves, each one of us. We need to look at our, our own fellowship, our own little church, or yeah. what's going on among us and see and make sure that we're not allowed. But we can't help it, it see what's going on in other places. We can't help see what what other organizations, and I'm not trying to put anybody down, what's going on in other churches, but I see things taking place today in our society that wouldn't have took place 20 or 30, 40 years ago. They're allowing spirits, they're allowing ways of thinking to come into a church, and what has happened? The church has become carnal. The Spirit of God has died out. People are just being, they're going through the motions. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to serve the Lord just so I can say I read or I prayed or I preached or I sang. If that's all that we do, we just go through the motions, then we're, we're, our motives are completely wrong. Amen. But we can't help but see what's taking place around us. I see so-called Christians doing things today that would have been unspeakable would have been absolutely unspeakable 30 years ago. Am I right? That's right. And they, they, they have no shame. There's no shame. I mean, honestly, people run around like this is all there is. This is not all there is. People feel three things. People feel they have the right to interpret. This is talking about churches, religious organizations, even among us. People feel that they have the right to interpret the scripture any way they choose. We don't. And even as a minister. That's why the Bible says to study to show yourself approved. And so much more. And so much more if we're... If we're in a leadership position, if we're, if we're preaching and teaching other people, so much more. I do not have the right to make the scripture say what I want to say. I do not in any way, in any way, shape, or form have the right to make the scripture say anything that I want it to say. There has to be a continuity between the scripture. When I begin to make the scripture fit what I want, my desire, my agenda, then guess what? I'm being influenced by that spirit. Amen. Amen. Number two. Have attached themselves to the name of Christian outside. People that people have attached have attached themselves to the name of Christian outside of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. There is no Christianity outside of the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Amen. That's just scripture. We go back to the book of Acts. I didn't make the rules. I didn't set it up. We go back to Pentecost. We go back to Cornelius' house. We go back to any evidence of the Spirit of God within the early church. And every single time there was an indwelling of the Spirit of God. But people walk around today and 